Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated this evening. We ended last week on how Jesus loved them, and so he stayed two days longer. And uh, so that's where we pick up. Verse number seven is where we pick up uh, this week. And he says, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. He's loving Mary, he's loving Martha, he's loving Lazarus, and he is loving the disciples. This is all part of loving the disciples as well as Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He has some things that he needs to teach the disciples because apparently three years into this, they don't get it yet. I mean, the disciples are rightly... I, I have referred to them before, I'll do it again, as the disciples for a reason, right? And because you just get the feeling that oftentimes they're just duh. And so Jesus says to them, hey, I got an idea. Let's go to Judea again. Um. I love the way he says that, the way he introduces the idea. There's no context to it. It's just, let's go to Judea again. That sounds like fun. I got an idea. Let's go to Judea. He's just been, we're sometime between the winter of Hanukkah and the spring of the Passion. It's not very many weeks ago they tried to stone you for the final time. And you are actually hiding out 12 miles across the Jordan where John the Baptist first started ministry. You're actually hiding out here. There are orders uh, uh, for your arrest. For There are informants everywhere. Jerusalem is abuzz with... Is Jesus going to come here? Is he coming back? How, where is he? Does anybody know? Because the authorities have already put out, and the, the, the news is about, if anybody sees him, make sure you tell us. Now, in the countryside, he's, there's one thing. In, in the city, there's something. It's kind of like Jesse James. Jesse James, at the beginning of his outlaw career, actually the farmers were quite um, sympathetic to him. Jesse James, being from a farming family, when the, out, when the uh, railroads began to cross through and take the land and build the railroads and all of that, it really made a lot of farmer folks mad. And when Jesse Stain James started his campaign against the railroads by robbing them and all that, listen, a lot of the country folks were not going to inform on Jesse James. Now, go to the bankers, they turn him over in a heartbeat, right? But the people in charge, the people in power, yeah, they wanted him. They're the ones printing out as many wanted posters as they could. But you get out into the country, they're more than willing to hide him. Uh, at least in the, the, the initial part there, they're really sympathetic to his a cause there. And so Jesus is hiding out in a place that's friendly. And many people are coming, the Bible says, and many are believing in him there. He's got a sympathetic crowd there. And the disciples' minds, why do you want to leave this safe haven here? And go back to Judea again. And not even and Jesus doesn't provide any reason for that. There's no context. There's no reason. It's just a request. Let's go back to Judea. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? The disciples, on the other hand, here's their response. The request, if the request is, let's go to Judea again, the request is, let's not and say we did. That's the disciples to that. All right? The disciples are just like, <laughs> seriously? Are you kidding me? They just tried to stone you again. Here we're safe. There you're not. What, what part of this equation are, are you not getting here? How many times can we escape out of their hand? How many times can we pass through untouched? How many times? Is sooner or later, our luck is going to run out. Your luck is going to run out, and our luck is we're going to be with you when your luck runs out, which means our luck runs out as well. And so the disciples are really hesitant about this. And Jesus gives this 
answer before he gives the reason. He says, there's 12 hours in a day. Night's coming. We got to work while the day's here. If you work during the day, you've got light to work by. You work at night, then, then you're in trouble. That's basically it boiled down. And from that, I just want to bring out two really quick things before we move on to the core of the text this, this evening. There's 12 hours in a day. He has presented them an opportunity which they are willing to set out because of their own reason, because of their own fears, because of their own inability to grasp who Jesus really is at this point. They're, they're, I mean, they've seen him do some really powerful stuff. But even at this point, three years into it, they're unwilling, if they don't have to, to push their luck. They're willing to set out the opportunity. Jesus is presenting an opportunity if he wants to go, he has to have a reason for it. We're not even listening to the reason. But here's an opportunity. I'll pass on this. We'll let somebody else do it. Then, and so here's the other part to that is not only is there an opportunity while there's day, but there's going to be a point in which opportunity is lost. Night is coming. He specifically says, are there not 12 hours in a day? The, the, in other words, there's an urgency because, yes, there's 12 hours, but there's only 12 hours. There's a set time. Night is coming. The end is going to come here. There's going to come a time when all opportunity is lost, when the door is closed, when the ark is shut. When there will be no more witnessing. When there will be no pleading. When there no, will be no more intercessory prayer. When there will be no more trying to bring them in. Bringing in the sheaves will be a done and finished project at that point. The ministry will be over at that point. Night is coming, Jesus is saying. Right now, we have an opportunity. Let's take it. Can I ask you, do you take every opportunity that presents itself? Do you take every opportunity that Jesus presents? That's what he's doing to the disciples here. Here's an opportunity. I'll set this one out. Then he starts to give them the reason. Lazarus is asleep. I'm going to wake him. Prime example of the disciples. If he's asleep, he'll wake up. Do you, I mean, I can't imagine 12 men sitting around this place and thinking that Jesus is saying, boy, he's in a really deep sleep. And I think he is going to miss work tomorrow. I better walk 12 miles to wake him up. Like Mary can't do it. Martha can't wake him up. Nobody else is going to wake him up. They're saying if he's asleep, he'll wake up naturally. And John, well, surely, Pastor Jim, they didn't really think. John says that's what they thought it, it was, that they were thinking he was talking about natural sleep. Did they honestly think Jesus is, is going to walk 12 miles into the heart of danger, two miles outside of Jerusalem, just to say, hey, bud, don't you think you're a little long in the sleep? now? Can't we just wake you up? Yeah, and uh, there's things to do here. And they're, they're, they're just, uh, when they say that, Jesus has this great response. He says, he's fallen asleep. Now Jesus has spoken of his death. So when Jesus, so, 
<laughs> that he was speaking of his death. Verse 14, so Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. There's no sugar coat in it. I tried to fluff it up. I tried to use some better, non-harsh, the kinder, gentler way. Lazarus is dead. You almost want to just put a palm smack on Jesus, right? While he's standing in front of them and just have him do the palm slap. Like, are you serious, you guys? Really? And he goes, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. I love that. I'm glad for your sakes. Why would he say that? I'm glad he died. For your sakes. These are 12 apostles. They have not grasped who he is yet. This is an opportunity that they're unlike any other. Have they seen him raise the dead? Yeah, but not after four days. Not after they've been buried. Not after the stone is closed. Not after the mourners have all arrived. And all of this stuff that's gone on here, not after four days, they haven't really got who he is. And he said, in your future is going to come a time you're going to know, need to know exactly who I am. And I'm glad he's going to be all right. I'm going to wake him, but I'm sure glad you've got the opportunity to witness this. On an opportunity they were willing to set out. On a... On a, you've got to get that. This is an opportunity that was presented to them that they were willing to set out and to bypass and to let somebody else do it. That's what they're saying. Well, surely he'll recover. Maybe he can get over this by himself. Can't Mary and Martha take care of this? Why do we have to go 12 miles to wake him up? Why can't somebody else do this? Have we ever done that, said that to the Lord when he's presenting us an opportunity? He's presenting me an opportunity for ministry. There's an open door for a witness. There's an open door to say something, to pray with somebody, to do something for somebody, whether it's tangible or whether it's uh, emotional or counseling or whatever it is. Is there something that I'm being presented? I'm saying, can't somebody else take care of that? I'm kind of busy. I'm safe right here. I'm in my safe space right here. I mean, really, if they, if they really believed that he was God, would they be sitting here arguing with him? Would they be sitting here correcting him? Saying, hey, let's go to Judea. I don't think that's a good idea, God. I don't think that's... A... And yet, how often have we done that? I have been guilty of God presenting an idea and then me saying, boy, that's a wild one. Have you really thought this through, God? Have you thought, thought through all the ramifications and all the possible ways this could go sideways? Really, God, have you, have you, have you thought this one through? I've done that. You've done that. I don't know that there's a person alive who's called the name of Jesus who hasn't done that. Who hasn't said, Lord, I'll set this one out. Really, somebody else can do this one. I'm pretty comfortable right here. It's all because of a fundamental misunderstanding of who he is. They didn't quite get it yet. They were close. They're close. Don't get me wrong. They believe in him. They just don't know who he is yet. They, don't, they believe in him. I want, I want that clear. They are willing to follow him. They're committed to him. They just don't know the fullness of who he is yet. That's what's going on here. And so when he is here, and even though he's claimed deity, even though he's claimed God is his only and unique father in a way different from anybody else on the planet, they still, it's hard to grasp. It is a hard thing for them to grasp. I mean, they're first generation Christians. I mean, think about that. They're first-generation Christians here. They're just learning about this man named Jesus. 
And so we got to cut him, cut him a little slack. We've had 2,000 years to figure this thing out. They're just figuring it out on the fly. This is the ultimate OJT for them. And, they, and, they, and yeah, it's three years, but they haven't quite, they believe in him. They believe he's powerful. They believe there's something going on with him and God. They just don't know the fullness of who he is. And so they present, he presents an opportunity. They say, no, thanks. We'll sit this one out. Jesus says, we're, we're going to go. He's fallen asleep. He's dead. But I'm going to wake him. I'm glad for you because you're going to get to see who I am in a different way than you've been able to see before. Why? Because you're going to take this opportunity. <laughs> That's the end result. You know, there's sometimes opportunity comes knocking. Sometimes it comes and bulldozes your house. There's going to come a time where Jesus says, you need to learn some things about me. And we can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. We can do it by me presenting you an opportunity or we can do it by me just saying, we're going to go. And whatever I've got to do to get this point across, you're going to learn a lesson here and you're going to be better for it on the other end. Let me give you a spoiler alert. It's always better to volunteer. All right, let me just give you a spoiler alert here. It's always better to just take the opportunity and trust the Lord. It's a good one. All right, don't argue with him about it. When he presents the opportunity, just say, yes, I will do that. All right, I don't understand it all, but I don't need to understand it. You know, we, we are oftentimes guilty of having to have God explain things to us before we agree to the plan. We are often guilty of saying, why, how come, how this, how that, how's it going to work, what's the plan, when do we turn left, when do we turn right, when do we go straight, when's the check coming, when's this, when's that, when's the other, and how's it all going to play out before we finally say, yes, I'll sign up for that plan. And here Jesus is just saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I think he's still looking for people to just say, I'm, go I'm there. I'm going. I'm going to go. Let's go to Judea again, right where they were trying to stone you. Great idea. Let's do it. I love that. There's got to be a reason for it. This is going to be exciting. Verse 16. Verse 16 is an exciting verse. It is. Didymus, therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Well, Eeyore just showed up to the party. I mean, you can almost hear it in Eeyore's voice. Well, let's go with him so that we can die with him. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's really my first. Every time I read that verse 16, every time I read it, I get Eeyore in my mind with him saying this. Uh, just let's go die with him. Like nothing good can possibly come out of Jesus' plan. This is such a dumb plan, Jesus. This is such an ignorant plan. This, you have not thought this through at all, Jesus. This is going to lead to your death, my death, everyone dead. We're all going to die. Let's just do it together. But when you look closely at it, there's more to it than that. You see, the Synoptic Gospels only mention God, Thomas in the official listing of the 12 disciples. If you go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the only time they mention him is when they make an official list of the chosen 12. That's all you read about Thomas there. In John, you see him here and three other places in the Gospel of John. You're going to see him here, and then you're going to see him offering a question in the upper room. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way in chapter 14? 
The, set, the next place, the third place you're going to see it is the famous Doubting Thomas episode that happens a week after Easter in chapter 20 and verse 24. I think we really got to give Thomas some slack for that. After all, in the first century, there wasn't a lot of people bringing themselves back from the dead. All right, and this is a week after it happened here, and he didn't get the benefit of seeing Jesus. Hence, since there's not a lot of this going around, I probably would have doubted too. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, all we've got is these 12. How many jokes have they played on people the last three years on, on between themselves, right? You can't, get tw- you can't get our men's ministries grouped together without us playing jokes on each other. You understand what I'm saying? You, you think the 12 of them went around and never had a laugh at somebody's expense? And so you, you got to give him a little slack on this. At least I do. And then the final part is he's fishing with Peter. And the final resurrection miracle along the sea there in chapter 21. The point is this. Long before Peter stands up on the night of the betrayal, and Jesus says, you're all going to scatter from me tonight. And Peter, big mouth, says, if these other 11 knuckleheads do, I won't. I won't. I'm going to stick by you, and I'm going to, even if it costs me my life, and Jesus turns around and says, really? You won't? You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Long before his famous statement, here's Thomas. Peter's not saying anything. John the Beloved isn't saying anything. Nobody's saying anything. The inner three, James the Greater, isn't saying anything. Thomas is saying, fine. Though it cost us our life, let's go do it. Thomas is leading the 12. Thomas is encouraging his brethren. Let's take the opportunity. Let's take the opportunity. Let's go. He's showing himself this faithful and loyal and courageous disciple where all the other 11 are just stone silent except for I'll set this one out. I'll miss this opportunity. I'll let somebody else do this. Somebody else can take my place. It's Thomas who says, let's go die with him so that we can take this opportunity. You say, well, that's... What does that mean for us? Let me tell you what it means. Paul picks up on this theme when he says this. We have to die to self. Daily. You see, every day is a day of seizing the opportunity that God presents that day. And the only way we're going to take the opportunity as he presents them, because night is coming, there is coming an end point when the opportunity will be lost, either through the rapture of the church or through that person, us no longer having access to it, or that situation, or that crisis is going to be over, or the tenderness of heart will be passed, or the moment that the Holy Spirit is dealing with them will be over, or something where that opportunity is lost right then. It's only by dying that we're willing to take the opportunity. You see, before they could go to Judea, they had to be willing to die for it. Before they could take the opportunity in, in Bethany to minister to two sisters, ultimately to the Lazarus and to the world, they had to be first willing to leave Ephraim. They had to be first willing to leave their safe space, which means they had to be willing to die before they left. Here's here's the point for you and me. Tomorrow, 
there may be a great opportunity presented. But if we're not dead to self, if we are not willing to take the risk, if we're not willing to leave the safe space, if we're not willing to do the hard thing, if we're not willing to follow where he goes and where he's leading, even though we don't know all the circumstances and we don't know the outcome and we might not even know the reason or the context, all we know is an opportunity. That's all we know. We don't have to have all the information. The only way we consistently grab those opportunities is to first die to self and to die daily, day after day after day after day. I die daily. So that Paul could say this, it's no longer I that lifts, it's Christ. That lives in me. And when he's living with me, if he wants to go to Bethany, if he wants to go to Judea, I'm bound to go. Because it's no longer I living my life. It's Christ in me who lives. He's living his life in me. And he's living his life through me. Because I died. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this evening. Thank you for the poignancy of it. Just for the fact that you present it in such a way that it challenges us. It convicts us. And it points us to you. And the things that you want to do in us. That you want to do through us. I believe tonight there's opportunities that await that we're completely unaware of. I believe you have opportunities waiting in the wings for those who will die to self and who will die daily and let you live your life in them and through them. I believe there will be powerful results as there was in Bethany at that time. I believe when we take those opportunities, it allows you to roll away the stone of yet another heart and another one who's dead in their trespasses and sin. They come out of that tomb. And they're alive in you. All because we're willing to take the opportunity that presents itself, that you present to us. But Lord, we're only going to do it consistently when we die to self. Would you help us? To do that? Would you help us to be willing to, with Thomas, stand up and say, though it cost our lives, let's go. Let's do it. There's an opportunity. I pray you would help us with that.